in, in prayer this week. Amen? Amen? amen. The Lord heard you and said amen. Okay? So, just send a little surplus prayer up. I have a little message to share, but I think I'll keep it very long tonight. Thank you for breaking the antique tradition and coming out when rain come. When rain come in antique, people don't go work, they don't go to church, they don't go nowhere. We're going to break that. They go fet though. And Ken, yeah, they go Kentucky too. They go Kentucky, you want to see the lion. They have fet today and I show the fet full. Amen. We can do a little better as church. When rain come, we stay home. Amen. Have mercy on us, Lord. We endeavor to do better. All right, so the last two weeks, we've been discussing the fact that God tests his people, that none of us are exempt. Once you're called by his name, he tests you. We began in Exodus 16 and 4. Um, just as a, a, a way of reference, as I, in case you weren't here for the last two weeks, then said the Lord unto Moses, Exodus 16 and 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. God said, I, that I may prove them, that I may test them. We're in CXC time right now, I think. Exams are starting again next week, common entrance or very soon. So it's a season of testing, very appropriate for us to be reminded that even as the children are tested, we are also being tested too. And um, it, may, it may not be my most exciting message, most bouncy message, but it is a kingdom reality that our king tests his subjects. Our king tests us who are called by his name. And um, our king, he observes our responses to these challenges. And based on our actions, we get promoted. Sometimes we get do-overs. And sadly, sometimes we get disqualified. I pray that these messenger, messages are a blessing to you as they are to me. I've been meditating on this, saying, God, I want to pass the test. I want to make you look good. And even today, I was um, thinking about um, testing and tests. It's been a while since I, I left school. But the word that jumped up to me, it's not a message tonight, but just as, in, as you, I pray that we meditate on these things even when you walk through those doors, that God can continue to speak to us. And as I've been talking to you about testing, what came to my spirit was study. And I thought to myself, study and testing tend to go hand in hand. When you hear about studying, we are studying for a test that's coming. I thought that Paul told Timothy, study. And uh, the more we recognize that we are going to be tried and tested. That should be a motivation for us to study God's word. And I thought to myself, just like in the natural, many people fail the test because they don't study. And I wonder if that's why many Christians fail in this Christian walk, because we don't study. But we are going to be tested. Not bouncy, not excited, but very true. We looked two weeks ago at God testing his people with a manna. We looked last week at a young Joseph being tested within the area of his sexuality, being tested. And I want to look at another story today from God's word as we see over and over that our God keeps testing us. And I think if we want to go higher, we have to make up our mind that promotion is not going to come just because we want it, not because we sing louder, not because we're good people. Promotion only comes with passing, and we have to pass the test. Not emotions, but practically passing the test that God would send our way. Anybody want to be promoted? Really, really? 
Some people are contented just to be where they are. But if you really want promotion, you say, God, next level. And the Lord say, yep, next level, next trial, next test, pass this, and you'll be promoted. Turn me to Second Kings chapter 5, a very, very popular story, very, very um, preached on story, very well-known story. It'll make my task today so much easier. Um, Second Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by he the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was a mighty, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Sister Aggie gave me a ginger mint a while ago, boy. It's like a ginger mint on steroids. That one is the raw, raw ginger. Please forgive me, boy. They want to give me a little punch like a while. All right. So, um, the story starts up with a soldier. Not just a soldier but a captain. He was um, a Syrian by the name of Naaman. He was a general. He had many soldiers under his command. The Bible says he was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. And he was a great man. He was a captain, so he had great power. When he said men jump, they jump. He led men into battle. He had tremendous power as a leader but it also says that he was a great man with his master and honorable i did just a little bit a little dig in there in that he was highly esteemed with the king of syria his master he had men under him but he also submitted to a king above him he had great inf he had great power but he had great influence in my notes, I had, I have, he had the king's private cell number. You could call him anytime. He was well esteemed with the king. And I thought, as I studied this, I said, Lord, the power of access. When you have access into power and access. He had access, he had power. Um, he was, the Bible says, honorable esteemed with the king of Syria because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. It's strange because the Syrians were not God's people. They were pagan people. But yet it says here that because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. It's, it's interesting that God used him to deliver Syria but we see no record that he knew God, but yet that God will use him to accomplish his purpose. Tonight I want us to look at this very familiar story. Pray that God would peel back a little and give us some revelation in that God is just awesome. And 20 something years I'm saved, I don't want to ever lose the fact that God is awesome. And Though you may have a, a master's in spraying car allergy, tiling allergy, you may have all kind of graduating all type of things. I'm saved 20 plus years and I feel like I'm in God kindergarten. His ways are just so beyond understanding. Even in the affairs of the king of Syria, he was using this Naaman to bring deliverance unto Syria. Not, not Israel. But even in Syria, the Bible said that God used him to deliver Syria. He was a mighty man in valor, which means he was a brave warrior. Some translators said he was a brave warrior. He wasn't a coward. He was a great captain. 
a, you know, an honorable man. But the Bible says he had leprosy. He was a leper. Let me humbly encourage anyone on the sound of my voice here or online. As, as we get older, I want to just challenge you. For, ah, the very best that man, at the very best, is still man. And uh, no matter how much power, influence, affluence, wealth, one translation, Arthur said he was a wealthy man, and I wouldn't doubt it. But for all of that, at the very best, he was still man. And the very best of man is very fragile. Anybody get, get the memo yet that we're fragile? When I was young, I, feel, I felt like indestructible, untouchable. You ever seen those children under the merry-go-round and the, um, the crazy rides in Orlando and, and they just, like if they don't have no revelation of debt, up and down, all kind of madness they do, I'm like, boy, you so, you so young. But the older they get, you should get a little wiser to realize and take notes and look around that for everything that man is. Some men haven't got the memo yet because they're still very arrogant. But you should get a memo in life that teaches you that no matter all the money you have, the influence you have, who you, where your parking spot is, there are some things that money can't take you out of. There are some things that you can't make a call and somebody give you a little blight. And one of those things are a sickness. I did a little study, because I remember it so much tonight, but I, let me tell you a little bit about leprosy. Leprosy, it's a dictionary definition, is a long-term infection by the bacterial, bacteria, Mycobacterium lep, lepri. This, is, this infection can lead to the damage of the nervous system, um, the respiratory tract, skin, and even your eyes. So basically, think about this. Leprosy damages your nerves, it damages your skin, it damages your eyes, and it damages your breath. It's a terrible, terrible disease. I was thinking about putting up some pictures, but I said, I don't want to um, gross out anybody in here today. But leprosy is so... It's not uncommon, as I Google it, that persons with leprosy, their, their limbs would fall off. You'd see fingers off, hands off, nose drop off. You'd see all... It's, it's not a pretty sight at all. They said that the nervous damage may result in a lack of ability to feel pain. It may lead to the loss of parts of a person's extremity. And um, an affected person may also experience muscle weakness and poor eyesight. So, the fact for who Naaman was, he, this leprosy would have taken everything from him. His strength as a warrior, even his sight. Um, he would be in, he would, his nerves, so many things of who he was would just be, would, would be taken away with this diagnosis of leprosy. And I'm telling you, we pray and we thank God for his blood as we sang, because sickness can bring the greatest of us to our knees. And such was the case here with this powerful man, Naaman. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. There's a part of the story that, I'll be honest, I don't understand, the Bible doesn't say. But traditionally, when a person has leprosy, they're always taken away. Um, from among people. They're always put in a leper. In a, even in Antigua, we have had leper colonies where they put lepers together and they're taken out of active society. Um, we see in verse 2 that there was a little maid. 
taken from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. Verse 3 says, And she said unto her mistress, I also want to put in notes too, we learn about Naaman, his valor, <laughs> we learn about his connections, we learn about his sickness, we, we also learn in verse 2 that he was married. He was the husband of one wife. He was a smart man, because no wise man wants, can handle more than one wife. Glory, hallelujah. And this maid, this captive, this little Jewish girl, wasn't brought here of her own will. In these times of war, they would go in and they would read and even in the midst of that, they would take the women, bring them into slavery, and she was brought in, a casualty of war in some degree, in some regards, and she got a position with Naaman's wife. She served her. She was um, her servant. And verse 3, I don't know how old she was, and the Bible says, And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. For he would recover him of leprosy. <clears throat> uh, there's some virtues, church, that I think... Um, I want to propose to you that Naaman, as you go through this story, though not a perfect man by any extent, I believe that Naaman had some good qualities. And we're going to see, I believe, the lens that God will go through to get a good man is so interesting, and how he orchestrates things. Because this young lady, though a servant in the house, she seemed to have such compassion for Naaman. She said, would God that my Lord, Naaman were with the prophet that is in Samaria, that he would recover him from his leprosy. In my imagination, I thought to myself, if Naaman was a cruel, wicked boss, like a girl would say, he's soon dead, my glad. But somehow she had compassion on Naaman. Right? She was in captive, but she had compassion. I'll tell you the truth, and I'll, you'll understand it maybe more, but <laughs> even if the Bible don't give this little girl a name, as I studied this story, it really touched me. Um, this little girl's compassion. She had, such, she had compassion on him. She said, you know, uh, would to God that he was with that prophet in Samaria. She showed compassion for him that he would recover him of his leprosy. But not only that, what touched me too, I said, God, look at her faith. She had faith. We don't even know her name. We had a big title about name and all what his, his accolades were. But here's a little, a little slave girl. We don't know her name. But what, what we see loud and clear her here, her faith. And I, I thought about, what kind of faith you have? You have big people faith or you have childlike faith? Hmm? What kind of faith you have? Big people faith? Because sometimes that's our problem now. We have big people faith. We think too much. Here the young lady said, don't hold short, little, little lady said, yeah, what? Leprosy? Doctors say incurable, especially in this time. Incurable, no cure. Boy, if he was in Samaria, my God would just cure that. You see, faith is found in some strange places. And I, I just looked at this little young lady, and I just thought to myself, boy, God, give me some childlike faith just to believe your word, that you're a healer. Because this little young lady it's like almost a star in this story to me. Just a little cameo. She just drop in, not even her name. But she said, I would to God that Naaman um, were in Samaria. Because there's a prophet of God there that would just recover him of his leprosy. I just say, God, help thou my unbelief. Let me just come like a child. Children just believe now. And this little girl, I don't know how old she was, but she had such great faith. And something I'm aspiring towards, to have this childlike faith that God is able to do just what he said he will do. Simple. 
Just simple, not too much of theory, theology, this, that. God said it, I believe it. And she believed with all her heart that God would heal this man. That leprosy was no, no test to the God she served. How big is your God? Is he a healer? Is he bigger than the book? Is he, does he have the whole world in his hand? How big is your God, really? That when problems arise, the little girl say, my God will box down that. Hello? Or when problems arise, you start to say, who can I call to get a loan? When, when an incurable disease comes, do you say, oh gosh, come and write my will. The first thing when this young lady heard about this incurable sickness, she said, small matters, my God can heal that. Anybody want, want a little more faith? Hello? We want more faith. I want childlike faith. Little girl just say, look, small matters, leprosy, cha. My God, and, this is, and some of these stories hit me because this is even before Jesus, before Jesus died on the cross, before the church and Bible study, and ah, the faith that was in this, this young lady's heart to say, my God can do anything. And it all starts with a little faith, mustard seed faith. If you have faith the size of mustard seed, speak to the mountain, say, thou be removed, and we cast in the sea. It made me wonder what kind, of, what kind of faith I have. Hello? Sorry, I know all you are here, spiritual giants. I apologize. I just hear just, um, you know, pray for the pastor. Amen? Say, Lord, give pastor night a little more faith. And um, her faith, her compassion, her trust in God, that nothing was hard for him, that he can do the impossible. And... Uh, she was speaking to Naaman's wife. And look at verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Somebody, because I don't know if Naaman's in the picture because he had leprosy, Probably he's isolated. It doesn't seem like he was in the room or if he even could be in the room because lepers are taken away from everybody. And it would have, this, the fact that he's not in the room, in the narrative here, suggests to me that he was isolated. And again, we don't know the young, the young lady's name. And look at verse 4 again. Remember, the story starts out and gives us all these details about Naaman. No detail about it tells us where this young lady was from but not her name and then verse 4 it says and who and who went in what name he's Spanish you call him Juan that's joking it says that one went in and told his lord saying dust and dust said the me that is of the land of Israel let me tell you, see, God can use you to do, to do great things. And you can be in, numbered among the famous nameless. That God can use you to do great things and you can have a role to play in great things and your name not called. Because the Bible didn't mention the name of the one. Just one went in, right? But God was using this one. And I, I, I encourage you, don't worry so much about your name being called neither. In a world today where you forgot to mention my name. If you don't call your name, the vex, I don't come back to church because they, they want to be recognized and you know, printed and viral. The Bible says, and one went in. Can you play a part in the plan of God and your name not call and you feature? Without starring, can you serve? And here it is, one went in. He heard. It's the revelation in this too. He heard, he overheard. And went in and told his Lord, which I, I believe is the king of Syria. And the king of Syria said, verse 5, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. You know why I believe Naaman was a good man? Because soldiers are dying a dozen. They, already, they had already won the battle. Leprosy was incurable. 
And I know he had favor with the king of Syria, but if he was just a good soldier, I, I, the, the king would do anything to see him recover. You understand? Just like the centurion with Jesus went above and beyond for his servant. I want to tell you, you know, and this is an admonition to you and to me now. There are some people out there who don't know God and make a hurry who know God look bad now. Well, me rewind the tape again and play it slowly. Some people out there in Syria, people out there who don't know God, they have better ways than Christian people. The centurion who was a big man in the army like this man had a sick servant home, a servant. And he went and besought Jesus, humbled himself that his servant would be healed. When Jesus saw his faith, the Bible said, Jesus marveled and said, such faith have I not seen in all Israel. Hello? There was something about Naaman that the king of Syria said, I'm going to, I am going to spare no resource to see my friend. Anything I, anything I am believing for a miracle for my servant. Because that's what he was. He was a captain. He was a servant of the king. But the king, when he heard this news of hope, the king said, go and go. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And, he, and Israel and Syria weren't even a great, great, no kind of terms. But he said, I, for this man's life, for to see this man restored, I am going to do anything to, that if there's a hope that he can be healed. We see compassion in the saved girl. We even see compassion in the king of Syria. I want to challenge you, no matter how much Bible you know, no matter how much scriptures you learn, the Bible says Jesus being moved by compassion. If you don't have compassion, you can't move in the kingdom of God because compassion is a gas in the car that moves for God so loved that he gave. It's not just about your head regurgitating scripture and theology without compassion, love for others. You are of no use in this kingdom because this kingdom is not about maths and English and who can memorize and regurgitate. I just looking at this verse story, and I know we've read it before so many times, but you, you, you see compassion here in the strangest of place, in a Syrian king willing to do what he can for his friend. I may not be my deepest sermon I ever te teach, but as I've looked at this, as I meditated in this, you know, I just feel, say, God help me. Don't let, don't let my heart go cold. Because in this work, sometimes your heart can get cold. But God, you know, keep that fire of compassion burning in my heart. My love for my fellow human being. Amen? Anybody know people hard to love? No, you are so holy. I forget who I'm talking to. I forget I, I, I talk to such spiritual people. Please forgive me. But anyway... As we go through the story, we see compassion, we found, we found faith, we found hope. Even in this Syrian king, he had a little glimmer of faith to say, what? God heals? Send him down there, I can write a letter. You don't see faith in the heart of the king? How much faith do you have in our heart? Say, let's pray, somebody's sick, let's pray for them. Mm, I'm not sure. But the king said, come. Even I don't know what, what amount of faith he had, but he said, yes, I have faith that God, there's a God and that he can heal this. My friend. Hmm. And I will go to, go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. You see what value the king had on Naaman's life? All of this he would give that his friend would be healed. Hello? 
keep in mind, this is, this, this is a Syrian pagan king that would send down 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 talents of silver, change of raiment. Raiment was a big thing in those days. 10 changes of clothes for his friend. Because I believe, and I keep saying this, most of the people that get excited about money are people who have never had it. Let me say it again. Most people that get excited about money are people who have never had it. Because people, many people who have experienced wealth will tell you it's overrated. It can't bring joy, it can't bring peace, it can't bring so many things. You can't go to your bank account and say, I need some advice. I need some comfort I'm going through something. And I believe this king of Assyria, it shows us what value he placed on the life of his friend. 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 talents of silver, 10 change of garment, all of that he would give, that his friend would have a chance to function normally in life again. Keeping in mind, he's a pagan, unbelieving king. Hello? I just want to challenge you. Sometimes you can learn so much from the unsaved, because sometimes unsaved make us look bad. Hello? Hmm. Moving right along, I, I know you all know the story so well. Um, um, so he sent, he sent the silver, the gold. He put his money where his mouth was. He say, by faith, here's what I'm willing to offer, that this one man would have a, a, a chance at life again. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. He, he brought the letter to who? The king of Syria sent the letter to the king of Israel, right? Israelites are God people. Big king, right? Here the Bible says, And he brought letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, be, uh, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Boy, it... You talk about opening up an email. Let her come and let her say, Hey, I sent my servant. Just heal him of his leprosy. Hear the response from the Christian leader. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he tore his clothes, rent his clothes, and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Big king, no. Big king, big title, big position, great power. I don't know one, <laughs> what kind of faith he had. Remember, it was the king of Syria send believing for healing now, correct? And the king of Israel don't believe in healing. Hello? Sure? You are with me? Let me, let me, let me give you a little story. I, I don't know if it's a true story or a fictitious story, but it's a story I read that there was a, a church in a town and a man came in and opened a casino and bar. And the casino and bar would make so much noise and it was loud, a small town. And the church went down in, into praying, asking the man if he can lock down on Sunday nights. The man said, no way. So they're having church, they hear the music blasting, the noise playing Titus. And the people in the church said, could you just turn it down? No. Can you? No. So the church went, went into a season of prayer and fasting, asking God to intervene. And sure enough, a bad storm came, lightning struck the casino and bar and burn it to the ground. The man that owned the casino took them to court. He said, Judge, they prayed and God burned down my casino and bar. So the, the, the judge looked at the pastor. What do you say? Pastor said, we didn't have nothing to do with that. The judge started to scratch his head. He said, this is a strange case you brought, you brought before me. The casino owner believe in the power of prayer, but not the pastor. 
the casino owner believed when they went to pray that God heard the prayer, send lightning for Bundong them place. And the pastor say, we had nothing to do with that. Sometimes you find faith in the strangest of places. The king, I, the king of Syria said, send down these offerings. My friend is going to be healed. And the king of Israel said, I want me name God. <laughs> Hello? I want to tell you, see, the word of God is so challenging for me, see. So here it is. The little girl had faith, the servant girl. The servant in Syria heard I had faith to go and tell the king. The king had faith for send down Naaman and the treasure. And now they get to church, get to the pastor, get to the leader. The pastor say, no, 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 I'm not sure about this. I know if our God still heal. Am I God? To kill and to make alive. And then here is where the carnal mind just gets so dangerous. You see, um, he says, You see, you see, he come to seek a quarrel against me. Let me tell you. I know not, not everybody aspiring to walk in the spirit. But I want to challenge you. When you're walking in the flesh, you will be totally blind to what God wants to do. I'm just saying that God's fingerprint is all over this story. From the young lady that was taken to captivity, to a servant overhearing and carrying to a king, to the faith in a king's heart to send on his servant for a miracle. And you see the fingerprint of God all over this story wanting to accomplish something. And you get to the people of God. You get to a king of Israel. And he, 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 he say, a problem a man they want in with me now. A why he want now. A, quarrel, a problem here, look. He was totally oblivious to what God was doing. He didn't even seek God. To say, God, I bring a letter before you. Are you up to something? Are you, all things are working for my... God, are you working out something here? He got straight carnal mode as a big king and say, an argument, this man here, look with me now. Big king, but dead wrong. The story so far filled with all type of faith until he get to Israel. Have mercy, Lord. And, um... Hmm. Do we have... The confidence when, when that report comes to us that God can fix it. <laughs> we sing the nice Christian songs, but I tell you, when the rubber hit the road, oh, how we need, how I need to be led by His Spirit. And um, verse, verse 8 And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, <laughs> that he sent to the king. You see how the news spread? King up there panic, a chimble. Say, boy, why them look now? They want reason for attack. What me name God? Big drama. And the news spread that the people of God, they dip on nothing. Hello? Plenty hearing. In this story, is plenty of people hearing. Young girl heard about her master. This man heard, carried news back to the king. And the story continues. He says that when Elijah heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? He sent and tell the king, <laughs> What happened? What happened? Let him now come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. I wonder, Elijah's response was that the king up there panic about little leprosy. Our king, ruler, people of God, one case of leprosy, and he don't go in a panic mode and start rip up his clothes. Something rose up, I believe, in Elijah. I believe Elijah sought the Lord. He said, hey, send that man down to me. And let them know that there's a prophet in Israel. The invisible hand of God is, is, 
working to accomplish his plans. Elijah had the confidence to believe that God can fix it. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, God can fix it. I don't know what your it is. No, serious. I have a practice too, because our faith is just sometimes so cerebral and not practical. That we can quote scriptures, by his stripes he were healed, but we don't believe that he heals. Hello? He can fix it. You believe he can fix it? So we are not sure. He can fix it because he is God. Hello? And I want to stir your faith because this is a good story. Stir my faith. I say, God, help thou my unbelief. You believe he can fix it? You believe? Faith, our faith must be exercised. You hear me? Not just theorized. Our faith must be exercised. And, <laughs> boy, <laughs> and I'm just thinking, king up there, panic, chip out, tear up, close, our money, a fret, oh God, a war, a war. And he got a message from the prophet saying, chill, send the man down by me. Hello? Oh, for a church again, that when the government have problems and the, pro the government don't know what to do, the answer is found in the church. Hello? For the confidence that when you have national matters that the leadership would say, send for the pastors. Let's hear the wisdom of God in them. And, and I know I segue a little bit, but I find that how relevant is the church and national issues? Sometimes we, we, we don't even get a seat at the table. Because when we get there, we don't have nothing much to see. Hello? But the solution to a national problem was found in the mouth of a prophet. Hello? And when the leader had the problem, didn't know what to do, he got a letter from the church saying, we'll handle this. And he said, call for the tailor and sober up my shirt. Everything is going to be all right. That's the plan of God now. That we move in wisdom, authority, and power again. That when people back against the wall, your phone ring, you say, who's this? Because they know to call you as a servant of God. Some of our life just so anyway, shaky. and We're so kind that when they call us, we're crying too, like the king. Verse 9. <clears throat> the man of God said something stirring him. I said, there's a God, and, there's, and God have a people in the land. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. This to me is interesting to get again because he had leprosy and uh, he was in his chariot, perhaps isolated. He had an entourage. You'll see that later. And he came <clears throat> isolated in his chariot, I believe, because of the leprosy. And he stood at the door of the house of Elijah. As a leprosy, you couldn't just go. You had to be quarantined in some, some, some extent. And verse 10. So here come the horses. Here comes this chariot, this entourage around him. And they pull up to the tent of Elisha, the door of the house of Elisha. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go wash your kin. Sorry, that's the much nice translation. A servant comes out to him and says, I keep telling you all now, I want to challenge you. We talk about you want to be used by God. Someday God give you some strange message to deliver. A big entourage pull up, chariot, horses, soldiers, big man, round name and full regal, Syrian's best army. They say, hey, hey, my brother, um, Elijah, they're outside, they're outside, I'm holding a big people. 
Go outside and tell them I say go wash them again. Tell them what? Tell them to go and wash his skin. Me? Yes. <laughs> and he said, okay. He said, let me get my face in order. If anything happens to me and chop off my head, tell my wife, me say my love, she tell me to pick me, they can have a piece of land over there. Because if me go and tell them, man, this, the Syrian army men, warriors in battle with sharp sword, it may be the last message I have to deliver. Sometimes, as servants of God, he gives us his word to deliver it. And it's not always easy and palatable to deliver. But God is only asking us to be obedient. Just to be servants. So when God's word says this about marriage, we go out and we deliver this word. God's word says this about holiness, you go out and deliver it. God, God wants is a servant who can carry message. Hello? And sometimes carrying message is not so easy. Because you have a... You have a um, a rough audience to deliver it to. And even though, I want to say, I want to applaud the messenger for going and delivering the message. And let's see what kind of good response he got. And he sent a message and he's saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Verse 11. And Naaman went. Verse 11. But Naaman... Cross, angry, miserable. Here comes Naaman and the vein in his leprous head just starts to stand up. And Naaman was wrought. <laughs> boy, thank God, boy. I, 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 my mind is still on the servant. When the name is it, sir, and Mr. Name and sir, the boss, <laughs> nice chariot, the boss, if I tell you, <laughs> go down by the Kawashi King, seven times a dip, seven times. And to see the response after delivering the message, but Naaman was wrought, angry. What do you do when you deliver a message and the people get vexed? Deliver it anyway. Hello? We all like to be liked. And here he said, he, he was vexed and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leprosy. I want to say to us tonight, that this is just so dangerous. These two little words, I thought. You ever script out God? Anybody ever script out God? This, this is how it's going to work. This is how my life is going to run. I thought by now I would be married. I thought by now I would be healed. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. Those two dangerous words, I thought. Hello? That want to script out to God how my deliverance will look. Can I say it again? Any, anybody ever guilty of thinking... I already, let me tell you something I'm learning, I've learned, I'm still learning about God. You ever watch a movie, and for the time the movie starts, as it starts to progress to the movie, you get vexed, you say, corny, predictable, for the time the movie starts, you don't know how you're done, and you say, I've seen this script a million times, and you get vexed, you say, corny, but let me tell you something about our God, he's not corny. The scripts that he writes have so much, you know, movies I like, movies that I don't know how, what will happen next. They keep you on the edge of your chair and you wonder, where is this movie going? If you watch a movie and every time you think you know where it's going, the movie take a twist, ax, and a hand lever, crack, and you hyper edge your skin, because you don't know what will happen next. 
The right is just so creative and the storyline just so different. You have no idea what comes next. Welcome to God. Hello? Be careful when you script out, I thought. I learned the hard way now. I never thought I would be here today now. I was in church, growing church, big church, title. I thought I would just succeed from there and become a little junior pastor. What you thought? Hello? You thought you'd be here now? I thought I would be over there. But I'm learning more and more. Say, <laughs> Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Just to buckle up in faith and hold on for the ride. Because there's a way that seemed it right unto a man. The way I thought this would go. Anybody learning right now? Jesus, take the wheel. That's like the wheel, Jack. Can't matter how you thought. Come on. You, did you think you'd be here tonight? Look, God, have a way. Just, ah, ah, ah. I said, oh, I didn't think I'd be here. But here I am. And I know it's God. Come on. Naaman was guilty of what many of us are guilty of. Scripting out the way that God works in our life. It's interesting too because even the context, I want to believe he did some study on Elijah. And he says, I thought that you would come out call the name of the Lord and strike his hand over this place. In terms of how, remember, they hit the water and they struck this and he had his mantle and so. So the context of what God did then is what they used to judge, what he used to predict what God would do next. Hello? It's dangerous when you think that God... <sighs> Moses came up to the Red Sea. Rod, right? The ministry of the rod. Correct, y'all help me. And the water part, right? Joshua came with the rod too. I thought the ministry was in doing, I thought the power was in the rod. God told Joshua, different formula, just step. Set that things in order, please. But and as you step, the water part. Hello? I wonder if Moses wasn't dead, if he'd run up and take the stick and gun, Joshua, bop! Come and tell you how you part water, sonny. Me and water part in expert. Hmm? Don't laugh. Because God did it that way before, you can't script God and demand he do it this way again. And that's why religion fights so hard against a move of God. Because they want you to move in what God did then. Now, because God won a battle in Saul's armor, the victory was never in Saul's armor. It was never in the method. It was never in the striking. It's always in hearing the no word of God. You hear me? He made a cardinal error, disappointed and angry, because um, Elisha did that before. He thought, this is how he's going to do it again. And let me tell you, he was vexed with Elijah, but sometimes we as servants and children of God vex with God because God didn't do it how we thought and when we thought. You are so holy. I love you all, see? I aspire to be like you all when I grow up. Hello? And he vex. Why he vex? Because he couldn't control the parameters in which God moved. The formula. And that's why, if you study the life of Jesus, Jesus so know that we love formula, that every time he came up to a sick person, he used a different formula. Sometimes he spoke, sometimes he lay hand, sometimes he spit on them, sometimes he spit in the clay. So every time, led by the Spirit, you can imagine if Jesus healed everybody by spitting on them. Uh, we as pastors, boy, I have a drink, have a big pit, pit. Because if that was the formula, no laugh. If that was the formula that Jesus used for everybody, we would patent it and say, Pastor, how much people can you spit on? Hello? 
But Jesus mixed it up because he know how we love method. Spit on them, spit in the clay, mix up the clay, this, that. There's even a man I found with Jesus where the Bible said he stuck his hand, his fingers in his ear, right? And touched his tongue. Imagine Jesus, yeah, there's, there's an interesting thing in Mark. He stick his finger in the man's ear, right? It's true. And touch his tongue and say, loose. And look, which I, say, I remember Christ said, Jerry, he'll open his story. Jesus said, dig his finger in the man's ear. But be careful, because you will think that's not of God. But it got results. You understand? We like method. I'm just trying to tell you, I speak to myself, don't script God. Don't script him into a pattern. Not, not because he did it like that yesterday, that means he go do it today. The victory is not in the method. The victory is in hearing from heaven what to do now. That's why we have so much religions, so many movements that are, now have become monuments and museums of what God, what started out as a movement. People hearing from God, we get a formula, we put a name on it, we stamp it, we call it a denomination, and we camp there. That's why they're doing the same things up to now. All right, let me finish this off. Check my time. And um, Naaman Vex. I thank God for the servant. He never could have the man head boy. Thank God for grace. Because he was really upset. He said, I thought it would have happened this way. Huh. Be careful every time you see I. Behold, I thought. I. Be careful that big I. See that idea? That's a big I. That I have prayed. And um, I thought. Here verse 12 now. Are not... A banner and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Excuse me, sir. What are you saying about rivers here? Hmm? Pardon. See, anyway. What do you say about Antigua, Kentucky? They say the best. What do you say? And here he come in a Israel at all about um, a banner and far, far, those are better than your waters down here. And they're better than all the waters down here. Look, me tell you, see, you human being are just human being. Right? He come from Assyria, which is a Syrian pride. Hello? Come on. <laughs> hey, may God help our hearts, see? Even when you come here for help, you still say, over oh, the better than you. Hello? Hello? People come here looking for help. And still I say where they come from better than here. Hello? Come on. Look at you. God wants to humble ourselves now. If over there is so good, how come here? Appreciate where you are. I'm going to pull back. You hear me? Over there, a better river. Waterfall. How can you hear? Backside and oil and all kind of stuff over. How come you're here? Humble yourself now. The river over there better than you, but no healing over there. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> the preaching thing can be dangerous. See, that's the word of God applicable to our situations. Hello? Where I come from? This better and that better. But how come you're here? You're here because you want help. You believe you can see we're better here. Hello? No? Oh boy. Oh, oh God want to humble us. And here it is that a banner and far, far were better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away. You know what? <sighs> Cross. Angry, miserable. Angry, in a rage, because God didn't move the way he expected. I want to tell you, listening to God is a dangerous thing. Because God told Elijah, don't even go outside 
and give him an audience. You know how far I traveled from Syria to come here? I thought he would give me an audience. You can imagine a foreign king jumping on a plane from Dubai, go um, with, uh, England, jump on another plane, JFK, come all the way to Antigua, Titus, pull up in an entourage in front of your house, and the Spirit of God tell you, don't even go outside and talk to him. Tell your servant to tell you what she can. Hello? How much of us would put on our best suit? Comb up, go outside, your majesty, Sheik Shugaboogie, so nice to have you here. But when you're led by the Spirit of God, it can be dangerous. Because the Spirit of God, who working in all of this, told Elisha, don't even go outside, just send the word. Hey boy, to be led by the Spirit of God. That God said, don't even go out. You know, up to now, he come for see. But God didn't want. God. <sighs> Let me show you something. <laughs> We're talking about being tested. We're talking about the test of God. Um, He came here with all his attributes, all his power, all his connections. He was a good man. Of this I am sure. He was a good man for all that he had. There was something in his life that God hated and something that God wanted to get rid of. And that thing is called pride. I was reading this week, six things God hated. Seven are an abomination. Number one is what? A proud look. Good man, warrior, brave. I believe he's a good person. But in all that he had, he was proud. And God says, I resist the proud. So I'm going to have to break that pride out of you. Your travel comes so far. And my servant in you won't even give you the time of day. No striking, no nothing. Go wash your kin. Because there's a pride in you that I need to break. Talking about the test of God. And he's angry. He's in a rage. Here verse 13 says. No. Um, verse 13. <clears throat> and his servant. <laughs> what a servant name. We don't want a servant name. Another servant doing big things without a name. How can we want name so much? We want our name in the story. Anybody want a name in the story? I don't mind my, my name being mentioned. And Matthew came, and Pastor Matthew came and laid hands, and he was healed. Hello? I'm trying to show you directly and deliberately from the pages of Scripture the influence of people and persons that the Bible does not even give, their, give us their name. What, what, what's God trying to teach us here? And his what? His servant came near and spake to him and said, um, My father, son of answer, turn away, right? The man vexed. And the servant came and said, uh, My father, um, if the prophet had bid you to do some great thing, um, would thou not have done it? How much rather than when he says to thee, wash and be clean? Victory in this life is predicated on hearing the voice of God. You nor me can dictate who God speaks to. But when we choose, oh, oh, prophet of God, great man of God, apostle D, he must have a word from me. Sometimes you hear God speak to you, even, I dare say, from unsafe people. You must have your ear open and your heart humble to hear the voice of God, even if he comes through a donkey. Hello? Can you see with me 
are angry, enraged, tired, in pain, eyes hurting, long trip, broken hearted, frustrated, scared. Naaman in this moment, a little servant, take a big risk and come and tell him. It was a big thing, Barasi, you to do it now, but it's a little thing where you have to lose. Hmm? How much of, you know, Naaman could just say, yo, cut off your head. Done the in that position, in that state, you know how dangerous it was for the servant to come over there and trouble him? Hello? But the servant, boy, it have, I believe this man was a good man now. And he's cool, I believe he's a good man. Because the servant again, see the angry, cuss over and after, and he go over. He say, Father, <laughs> you know, I believe he was loved. I believe at his core he was a good man. I really believe that. I think that's why God put this whole thing in motion. The things that God will go through for a soul. And um, he steps over. He said, it's a simple little thing, you know. And the big general was persuaded by a little servant. Can a little servant of God, a little servant, persuade you? When you hear the voice, do you hear the voice of reason, the voice of wisdom, the voice of direction, even if he don't come in a big robe and a big sound, can he come from a simple servant? Remember I told you now, this is a test. Think about what would have happened if Naaman would just fail this test. Anybody believe this is a test? The guy was testing him. Hello? But can you imagine if Naaman would have just, how much of us, well, I, I don't even know if I would have passed this test. How about you? You would have passed the test? You just humble yourself and go down in the dirty water for dip? Are your anger and your raw, your rage and your lack of self-control where you jump in your big chariot and roll down the road in leprosy? How many believers walking around with angry and covered with leprosy because they will not hear the simple word of God from his simple servants. And let me tell you, when our flesh rise up, it's so hard to hear, so easily offended. When we get vexed, I mean, I have no sense now. I know that. It's our Christian people professing that now. They pride themselves. When we get vexed now, for my head no good now. You know what I see the next side of me now? That side of you are what's stopping you from getting your healing and your breakthrough. Hello? Look, this, this, there's so much heroes in this story that we don't even know their name. From servant girl to servant that carried the message to servant that pop up. Any servants in here are, are, are superstars? In a world of superstar, pastors, superstar, ministers. Right, Reverend, Doctor, first, this, that, why? Sometimes they didn't even have room on the paper for print out all the accolades. I, Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the ways to keep people in church, I mean, come and get a little hint if, if you want, build a, build a big church quickly. Give people a title. I've been to churches, like a church now. Everybody has a title. Deaconess, prophetess, evangelist, everybody church have a title. And you see them running down the church every Sunday because they have a title. Might not have the power, might not have no, no anointing, but they have a title. And if you want somebody to stay, just give them a title because we love title. Give somebody a title and the title become an anchor and pin them there. I've seen it over the years. They now move. Even though they tell you, I'm, I'm evangelist white. How much people you ever lead to the Lord? <laughs> Big title, no power. There's a message in this story that speaks about a servant of the servant's heart to do the will of God without your name being mentioned. And the servant came and spoke to him. Verse 14. Then he went down. Even though we just skipped from 13 to 14, I want to challenge you that there was a battle that took place 
in between 13 and 14. The battle of the will of Naaman. That's not just a battle. That's a world war scenario. Because that is what makes the difference. When you hear the voice of God, how do you respond? That little between 13 and 14 are why people are in hell today, suffering eternally. Because when they heard the, vo the simple word of God, repent and believe, in that battle of their will, they said no. You hear me? Even though we just so gingerly skipped from 13 to 14, and he went down. I want to challenge you. You see that he went down? That he went down was not just geographical. The word pride means high, height, loftiness. You know, pride, you know, humility mean, look it up, low. Every time you hear about pride, look it up. The word pride, it means high, haughty, lift, literally it means high. And pride means, and, and humility means low. Where did Naaman go? He went where? He, come off, I off, he came off his high horse and his chariot. Not literally first, no. The first come down happened in here. You know why people are getting no healing in church? Emotional healing, um, spiritual healing. Because they will not come down. They will not humble themselves to receive the word of God. Because they thought... They are thinking and the way that they think it should. Look, I've seen so many people being destroyed because they lean to their own understanding. Sometimes they're more qualified than you. I tell Jairus all the time, they're smarter than me. But as a servant of God, God put a word in your heart, forgive them. They say, that can't be from God. I'm smarter than you. I, I'm more intelligent than you. Yes. But if that word came from God, if you don't do it, you won't get the response. And as easy as 13 to 14, I want you to understand a lot took place in the breaking of name and heart for Obi. Especially when you don't hype up in front of all the entourage. What happened to them? Dirty water, 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 better, better water over which part me come from. But all of a sudden, when the words of the servant prick his heart, you can imagine you tell a driver, oh, which part he said the river, they that are for go. Think about it. General just hype up like a while and, so, and a simple servant just gingerly go over and say, boss, it's worth a try now. And the, I believe steam star come out. The Bible says he was enraged. But something happened in his heart, a break in. And a conviction. And he said, turn the chariot around. What, what river he said to go to? Punching the coordinates in the GPS. Change the, we're going now. You know what, what way they went? God's way. So many on their chariot being led by their thoughts. Going their own way. Even though the word of God says something else. They lean into their own understanding. And all of a sudden he changed the coordinates of the GPS. To go down to Jordan. And when the Bible says he went down, it's more than just geographical. It's speaking about his heart. He starts to humble himself. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride myself in staying low with God. Because that's the key with him. No matter in how beautiful, intelligent, talented, gifted, all valor and everything you be. As long as you're proud, God say, dress back. I'm allergic to pride. There are denominations, churches that actually esteem pride. The more proud you are, the more loud you are, we bring you to the front. But that's not how we work with God. Remember David's brother, Eliab? Loud and proud, go to the back. Humble David, come to the front. Naaman almost failed the test now. 
But the word of God from his servant touched his heart. And the Bible said, then he went down. His volume went down. His pride went down. And he said, let's go down, Jordan. Hello? Some people will never, I know I live with this, because I know and it hurt me to see over the years, some people will never go down. They will never back down. Especially when they don't don't declare something, they won't back up, they won't pedal back. Because their will, their image is God. And they rather suffer with leprosy than go down. But that Naaman, he went down. He went down and dipped himself. How much times? Six? Three? How much time? According to the saying of the man of God. I got close here, but tell me this now. Tell me this. <laughs> I started by telling you how the ways of God are beyond understanding. Can you imagine God said to him, go dip seven times? You know, he could dip one time and get healed. You know, he could go in the water and look in the water and get healed. But God say, I want you to go dip seven times. That's my opinion. I believe so with all my heart if, because I believe that's how God works. You know, the first time you go and dip and come up, nothing change. Second time, nothing change. Hello? We like as we dip the first time, we see progress. Come church the first time, progress. Chapter fast the first time, progress. Nobody, you're so holy, no? Nobody like dip an instant oatmeal, instant. Nobody like instant results. Hello? Nobody like instant. I like, I would love to have instant results. And I would love every time I do one dip and come up, I see something change that give me the faith for dip a second time. But in my heart of heart, I believe he went down and come up and nothing changed. Let me ask the question. You ever obeying God, doing what God said and, and nothing not change? Huh? Looking stupid, dipping and nothing strange and nothing change? I wonder if one and two of them man in the entourage, because people tend to be people, as I laugh. <laughs> you know, one if people are people now. One time come up, wet down, man. Watch Shh. Sharp on my sword, I'll go back now for Elijah. <laughs> but every time he dip, he went down. He humble himself. The process that God carries us through. In a world of quick fix and instant, God says seven times. Every time you go down in obedience, I don't believe nothing change. And I believe again, Naaman was tested. One year, two year, three year. God tests our obedience to see if we will go the full length and stand on his word. But far too often, we go partially. Anybody can relate to partial obedience? Nobody? Anybody can relate to partial obedience? The word of God says, go all the way and you go halfway. Hello? You know, go full hundred. You know, give full hundred. You know, attend full hundred. You know, commit full hundred. You go a couple times. Nobody? And they say, wait. The word of God now work. <laughs> We're still leprous. Situation still bad. Could it be because you're not going all the way? Hello? Like a dab and do. Little halfway. But how many of us can we, how many of you can tell me honestly that you have gone all the way with God and don't see the results? When God's word said do this, bam 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 bam. And God didn't keep his part. Or can we truthfully say 
we get tired in the process and stop dipping. We do it good for the first and after a while, environment, our mind, things don't happen and we stop dipping. Hello? Pastor, I pray, I pray for somebody and they didn't get healed. Pray again. Why? The word says, by his stripes, we were healed. But I dipped, I tried, and it didn't heal right away. Do it again. Hello? Is God a man that he can lie? Hmm. Boy, I want, to, I want to tip my hat to Brother Naaman, see? Because simple as it is, he kept dipping. He kept dipping. I came tonight to tell you, keep dipping. Pass the test. God, if God said full, if God says seven, six and a half, not going to do. Six and three quarters, not going to do. God says seven, he demands a hundred percent obedience for a hundred percent results. But truth be told, we're not getting the results because we're not going full hundred. Partial obedience is disobedience. What area of your life is God speaking to you in, but you're not going the full hundred? Unequally yoked. And you see, unequally yoked. Big cow, little cow, two cow. The yoke can't go on their neck, you know why? Because they're not equally yoked. The yoke is the big wood thing that the two of them strap on to plow on in the field to do the work of the Lord. But one cow so little, it's unequally yoked because one cow here and one cow, one cow down there. Both of them save by both cows, both sheep, but the yoke can't rest properly because they're unequally yoked. Hello? I'm sending you at home. Naaman, in a beautiful moment in the sight of heaven, came down off his high horse, came down off his high chariot, came down from all his title and accolades and all the people he knew and how much subject he had and how long and he had the king's personal number. Everything came down and he humbled himself. And <laughs> got baptized in the river Jordan. And the Bible says, at the counsel of a simple servant, his flesh, hmm. can you picture with me as I close? <laughs> <laughs> That when Naaman came up that seventh time, the entourage, the soldiers, everybody that was traveling with him, one of the men said, Murder! How are you? I mean, how? Remember now, Naaman was coming up. Ah, when his forehead come out the water, his nose come out the water, water in the eye. And before he can even see the difference, he starts to hear, man around here shout, Hey, what? Miracle. And he looked down on his hand. Oil of holy. The Bible said that his flesh came like again unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. When he obeyed God, the results were even better than when he got the leprosy. He got baby skin again. I want to say thank God that Naaman passed the test of humility. Come like a little child. Come off your chariot. Come off of your thoughts and submit to the word of God. So, how, so, how, so, pastor, so how I think it should be. Thus says the word of God. Submit to the word of God if you want to see miracles take place in your life. His ways as far as the, sky, the heavens from the earth, his ways from our ways. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Lean not to thy own understanding. 
Anybody we are good at gifting to your own understanding? Any gifters? Any gifters in the house? That's a car when, when a man, we call it in the car, when, when they, they, it's drifting. Man turned into a whole profession, Titus. Drifting her car, so. Like, boy, you know, tire car. Just drifting and burning out tire, right? Drifting. I wonder how many believing Christians just drifting. Leaning, drifting to their own. Lean not to thy, lean not, drift not to thy own understanding. We have better water than this. They're Syria. I know God says this, but I don't know how it's going to work. You just lean. In fact, the reason you are where you are because you're leaning so hard to your own understanding against the word of God. And that's why the leprosy is still there. That's why you don't feel the way you should feel. You don't see the way you should see. So you don't feel because you keep leaning. The same mistake that Naaman made, I thought. I thought. Let me end the story with you here. Just run through it, verse 15. And he returned. Hmm. Well, let me stop. There's so much revelation in this, see? And he returned to the man of God. Boy. <laughs> you see, humility is such a... Uh, uh. Right. True humility will bring you back. Let me say it again. True humility will bring you back. Remember the one leper that got... You know, he didn't have to come back to Elisha. He had to go back to Elisha. The nine lepers didn't want to go back home. He had to go back. There are such signs of true conversion and gratitude to God. You hear me? He didn't have to go back now. But... Let me run through. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Testify, behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of your servant. He came back with a grateful attitude, ready to give back to God. Hello? He that been who he who has been forgiven of much does what? He who has been forgiven of much do what? Do what? I, I lay down my life. I've got a touch from God. I get a second lease on life. I come to give back to you. Not 2023 though. People come, they get. And they come again to see how they can get some more. Not how they can give to the service of God. Pastor, I'm here. I've been touched by God. What can I give? What can I render unto God? You, you, you need the bathroom clean? Anything you need? Let me know. I'll drop it off you now. I'm just so grateful for what God has done for me. I'm here to serve. Hello? You can imagine if Naaman went up to Elijah and said, Hey, my own cousin is sick too. What can I do for you? I can get some bottle of water and carry them back to Jordan for you. The heart of the taker versus the heart of one who has been touched by God that says, how can I give back? Look at the signs of a good conversion. Coming back in gratitude. Humbling himself before the man didn't even show him, show him the, didn't even come out and look at him. He come out, he open his mouth and profess. There is no God but Jehovah. There is no God but... He came, he said, there's no God but this God. And here he says, take a blessing. I, I want to give. I want to give my gifts unto you for the service of God. Real touch from God. Verse 16. But he said, Elisha, as the Lord live it, with whom I stand, I will receive none. What a thing, boy. 
But after if he was money. Anyway. <laughs> I received none. And he, hur- he urged him to take it. I, you see, I want to give. In light of what God has done for me, I want to give. So many takers today. What can the church do for me? I want more, more so. What? Leech, more, more, more. The man said, I really want to give in light of the touch that changed my life. A touch that gave me a second chance. I want to give. Anybody know it's like to get that touch? Anybody ever get that touch? Going down the road hopeless. And here comes a touch. And your leprosy is gone. Damned to hell. Isolated from God. Enemy of God. And God, oh, he touched me. Anybody know that touch? Sure. Anybody, anybody know that touch? Anybody can, can account and relate to an encounter of a hopeless man dying in his sin. And here comes a word and a touch that washed away all his sin. Anybody? Here's the response of a man who has received a touch and a washing and he's grateful and he says, I want to give. Verse 17. Verse 16. And, or 17. And Naaman, verse 17. And Naaman said, Well, tech problems behind here. Computer stick. And Naaman said, Shall there not thee, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules, burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord. He said, I'm changed, you know. I got a touch and a change. And I'm no longer going to worship that anymore. Verse 18. He is man, yeah. I, I, I just want you. And this thing, here a thinking man who get a touch from God and a second lease from life. Here we see. And this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. And when my master going into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. When I bowed all myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. Here is man don't think. When I go back, I'm the king's bodyguard. When the king go in this house to worship this God, and he bow, lean on my hand, I have to bow down with him to go in. And, but look at, look at the change that this man, after having a touch, already start to count the cost of the compromises he'd have to make in his life. He know he can't go back and be the same. You don't see that? He don't start to think through. It's not like get touch and go back and be the same like our Christianity. Go back and do the same things. He already begin to say, I can't worship and I won't worship. Oh boy, I'm having a problem. I'm going to have a compromise when I'm going in this temple with the boss now. But my heart not there, but I don't want to do it. Elisha, tell me, what for do? The heart of a, the heart of a man that gets a touch from God and want to do the right thing. And he said unto him, verse 19, and Elisha said unto him, go in peace. Go in peace. Just go. Your heart in the right place. God look upon your heart. You're willing to give it up. Go in peace. Go in peace. Um, so he departed from him a little way. I can leave it there. Um, wanna. Naaman pride was tested. 
He passed the test. He humbled himself before God. He didn't even look fully in the sight of men. He humbled himself in the sight of God and had an encounter and became a believer in the true living and only God. But it began when he went down. Left hand today. Change, healing, and breakthrough, real change, healing, and breakthrough first comes with diagnosis. Right diagnosis is the first thing, the first step to a change situation. What is it like to be diagnosed with pride? When you step into the doctor's office of heaven and God says, you're brave, you're valiant, you're charitable, you're a good man, but you're proud. And this pride in your life is what is stopping you from fulfilling your purpose in me. For me, it's so challenging because Somebody said, I think it's Robert Madhu preached a sermon on pride once, and he says, Robert, he said, pride is like, um, what are stuff that people take out the exhaust so they can't kill themselves? Carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide. And he started talking about how deadly carbon monoxide is, and he said, what makes it so deadly is that you can't see it or smell it. And the people, people die in the house with carbon monoxide. Say, why? Why didn't run outside? Because they couldn't smell it. And he said, that is what pride is in our life. We can't see it in ourselves. But God can see it. And though you can't see it, you can see the deadly effects of it. And every person in God who has lived has seen that little fox named pride. That little fox of arrogance that serves you well in certain environments. People never get a breakthrough. They never meet their potential in God. They might get status at work. They might get recognition. They might have phone numbers for big people. But heaven is shut over them. They won't have encounters with God because God resists the proud. On a scale of 1 to 10, how proud are you? Pastor, I'm humble. The most humble person there is. I love the fact that a proud person, the Bible says, I taught. Because that is the epiphany of pride. When you put I taught above the word of God. I am telling you, thus says the word of God. Scripture, scripture, scripture. Precept, teaching, example. Here's the word of God. But, but I taught. You put your opinion over the word of God. That's pride. God says, give a tent. I don't think I have to do that anymore. God says, do this. A tent. I don't, I, I don't think I have to do that. I have my personal time with God at home. I'd have to come to the sanctuary. But the Bible says, forsake not the self attend. But I, that's what the Bible says. I'm telling you, I have an intimate relationship with God. And here's what God says to me. Every time you put your thought above the infallible, never changing word of God, you usurp it. Your opinion is your God. He sits upon the throne of your heart and there's no place for God. How many pass the test of humility? How many die leprosy, leprously? Let's bow our heads. I want to thank you for this message today.
I want to thank you for an honorable, valiant man that humbled himself at the hearing of your word. He didn't hear it the first time. <laughs> I, th I thank you for grace. But Lord, when the word came again, he humbled himself and went down to Jordan. I pray today, my God, that by your Spirit, you will keep drawing men unto yourself. That you will orchestrate scenarios and things that look like bad, you turn it around for good. For Lord, there are good men out there that if they have a, a real encounter with you, they will serve you till they die. I pray that we will smell, myself included, the carbon monoxide in our life. I pray that we will smell the pride and the arrogance that stop us from being promoted. It's always somebody else's fault where we're not further along. Always something, something, somebody's church, pastor, this, that. Could it be the pride in our chariot that's stopping us from being promoted in you? Lord, tonight I pray that scales would fall from the eyes of your people. I pray that like little children, God, faith would come alive in our hearts. Forgive us, forgive me for being like the king of Israel. But having little faith, big title and little faith. Big, big title, little, little faith. Oh God, give us childlike faith today. You say, if we don't humble ourselves and become like little children, we'll no wise enter into the kingdom.